Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am excited to be leading today's conversation about building your career in sales at Appian. And before we get started, I just wanna go over a few housekeeping items. The first, today's discussion will be recorded and it will sent, be sent by email after the event. The second, please use the chat function to send messages and comments to all attendees and to the panelists. And that's also how we'll field questions. And then third, at the end of the discussion, we'll open up to questions from the audience. So if you have questions at any point, use the Q&A function to send them. And you'll also have the option of asking questions anonymously. So my name is Allison Borsatz. I'm a senior enterprise director here at Fairy God Boss in sales. And I joined the company in 2017 before the Me Too movement started. So I was one of the first 10 employees. And prior to Fairy God Boss, I spent over 10 years at Verizon. I started the organization as an account executive in sales and I left as a managing partner running a global sales division for them. So I'm incredibly passionate about women in sales and hearing their career journeys. And so today I am really excited to share with you our partnership with Atme Appian and what it looks like in a sales perspective. Now Appian is a low code automation platform for building enterprise software applications and faster. Today I'm joined by three successful sales professionals who are women in sales at Appian who will share their experiences and how you can take advantage of opportunities at the company. So I will let them each introduce themselves, their name, what they do at Appian, and of course, a little about their career journey and how they ended up at Appian. So Jessica, would you like to start us off? Absolutely, thank you so much, Allison. So my name is Jessica Hendricks. I am a senior sales enablement manager here at Appian. I joined Appian in March of 2018. I, prior to that, I actually was doing sales enablement um, with a healthcare technology company. I carried a bag there first for about two years and discovered I was actually passionate about enabling my peers and teaching people about our products versus selling our products. So that got me into the seat that I'm sitting in today. Fantastic. Nisha, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Nisha D'Amico. I'm a senior solutions consultant or sales engineer at Appian. Um, I joined in March 2017, so I've been here a little over four years. Um, prior to Appian, I was actually a software developer, so I started my career in STEM, did software development for about four, four and a half years or so. Um, by the end, I kind of realized that I was actually more drawn towards seeing things in the big picture and really understanding how what I was doing was impacting the business. Um, and so that's where I started to look at sort of hybrid tech business roles and sales engineering kind of just felt like the, the right fit for me. And so that's what I've been doing ever since. Excellent. And there is a huge need for women with technical sales backgrounds, especially coming from the engineering world. So I'm excited to hear more about that later. And Joanne. Hi, everyone. My name is Joanne Koo. I'm an enterprise account executive for Appian. I cover our New York and New Jersey broad market space focusing on media, manufacturing, and telecom companies. I've been with Appian for six years now, and prior to Appian, I've held a variety of different sales and marketing roles around business development, direct sales. So uh, going into enterprise sales was just a natural career progression for me. So I'm excited to share a little bit more about my journey here at Appian and having different roles within sales at Appian. Excellent. Thank you all for the introduction. And to kick this off, I would love to start with understanding what kind of career opportunities have you benefited from at Appian and how have they impacted your career? Nisha, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, there's been a lot. It's been a really, really interesting experience for me, especially coming from software development and being just being my first role in sales. Um, I think the biggest thing has been all the client interaction that I get to do. Um, so whether it's talking to a business group, an IT group, all the way up to the C-suite, uh, it's just really interesting to be able to interact with and learn from a lot of different people at a lot of different companies, understand what they're going through, what kind of problems they're having, and then being able to kind of be that person to say, well, here's this great technical solution, you know, that'll help you with that. Um, it's just given me a lot of exposure to so many different industries that I, I definitely would not have had any exposure to had I stayed in software development. Yeah, and being from the software development world, it must have been really interesting for you to move from being behind a screen most of your day to being in front of C-level executives. So yeah. how did Appian prepare you for that? And how did you make that transition? 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, Appian was really great about that. I was really thankful just to have that opportunity to make that sort of transition. Um, they, you know, I was able to shadow some of my peers in the beginning. So I was kind of, I was able to observe them and see how they handled those different crowds and understand what are the things I should or shouldn't say in certain situations and how to communicate to people with different types of, um, you know, experiences and backgrounds. Um, and so after a couple of months of shadowing, you know, I got to sort of start doing that myself. So it was definitely a, a slower transition where they made sure that I was prepared to do that role on my own. And it was really about learning from other people. And that learning really hasn't stopped um, in this entire four years that I've been here. I'm still continuously learning from my peers who are able to do certain things that I haven't been exposed to yet. And I'm also able to you know, pass that knowledge on to, to new people that join the team. It's great to hear that because it's really key, especially for salespeople that are transitioning to new roles or new skill sets to have that support system around them. And so it's amazing that you've been surrounded by colleagues that have been willing to mentor you and you've been able to shadow them and learn from them directly. So I'm really glad to hear that. Jessica, what about you? What sort of career opportunities have you benefited from at Appian and how has it been an impact on your career? So I would say career opportunities. I mean, I've really been able to uh, take on a lot of different responsibilities, enabling all areas of the sales organization. So I, our team is responsible for enabling our account executives, of course, our SCs, our BDRs, our partners, and then we work in lockstep with our sales leadership. So this has given me a much broader range um, and in scope in my ability to be able to create and deploy and implement activities that are going to benefit the organization and help drive overall company revenue. And I've also really benefited by being able to take on new projects that would have, in my mind, I think, traditionally sat outside of the scope of some of the things that I would have considered traditional sales enablement functions. Um, so that has given me, you know, a really great drive to, I've just had a great opportunity to learn and be able to actually execute some of the new skills through uh, that progression. I love that. And one of the things that we hear a lot in our Fair God Boss community is that women don't feel comfortable putting their hands up and asking for additional projects or projects come up and they're awarded to male colleagues or employees instead. So how did you get a chance to do that? Did you put your hand up and did you ask for those projects? Were you aligned with people that were mentoring you that gave you the opportunity? And then how did it change your career path in, in terms of things you learned or where you're going to be able to do those extra assignments? So that's a great question. I would say the first thing that most immediately comes to mind, the first year I was here, I remember doing our sales kickoff event. And once we executed, actually, it was on maternity leave for the first one. Um, but I decided I, I put my hand up and said, I want to do next year's and I want to own this. And then um, I was able to take that on and spearhead that in totality. Um, and what that's really given me and how that's affected me, I've learned this amazing new set of project management skills and uh, like event coordination and things of that. And I, I've, I love that part of my job now. And it's, it's a very integral part of my job now. So that's just given me a whole different, I believe, in my mind, skill set that I would not have traditionally gotten trying to plan like events and activities for the entire go-to-market organization if I were just kind of in that training facilitating and enablement role. That's amazing. So what would you tell a woman who's too scared to ask? I mean obviously there was all the benefits you just shared but how did you find the courage to do it or did you just go for it because you were like you know what I'm taking my career path in my own hands. Um, for me I just realized that it was something that I wanted to do. I, I knew that you know, I saw the way that it was done and I am a very ideal, like I like to, I have big ideas. I have big visions and big dreams. And I was like, I want to take that in myself and apply that here because I want to make it the best that it can be. So for me, it was just a natural thing for me to say, Hey, I want to do this and like, let's do it and let's run with it. And so, uh, you know, I, I would defer to Joanne and Nisha to say, I feel like the, the two SKOs that I've been responsible for have been pretty successful. So congratulations. And I love that you took the initiative. We need to do more of that as women overall, standing up for what we want at work and asking for those extra assignments and those opportunities for growth. Absolutely. Joanne, what about you? Yeah, so my, my career path at Appian, so I've had three different roles at Appian. Um, I started out as a business development representative. I was a BDR supporting um, 
two account executives for eight months. And then I transitioned to our small and medium business um, direct sales space. So I, I was in that position for about four to five months and then quickly transitioned to enterprise sales. So um, really just the natural progression of a salesperson going from like business development to then like more like inside sales and then enterprise sales. Um, and so with, within each phase of um, my transition, I've had really, really good mentors and good managers who've um, helped kind of guide my career path along. So one thing I will say is that I, I truly believe, you know, good shoes will take you to good places. Um, and the jump from um, the small and medium business account executive to going to enterprise sales is actually because um, one of my managers, and I'm not saying, you know, fancy shoes, everyone loves a pair of like Dior heels or Gucci shoes, but any type of good shoes um, will take you to good places because we, one of my future VP and I, we, we found that we had an affinity towards shoes and he is a much older male, but he really liked designer shoes. And so we just connected over a happy hour, just talking about, oh, this is the designers we like. So then just by having that natural kind of connection of, you know, we have something in common. We were, he was able to take interest in me as a person versus, uh, you know, based off of a real human connection where we can actually have more of like a true relationship. And through that, we were able to build a relationship. And then he eventually brought me onto his team because he was like, I know Joanne, she's a great person. She's um, fun to work with. So, so I will say good shoes take you to good places just because of that leap for me. Um, but ever since then, ever since I've moved to the enterprise sales role, I've had three different managers. Um, all three managers have been promoted up within Appian. So that just shows a testament of how great the managers themselves are. But within with each manager, they've been just so different. And that really helped me having been at Appian for six years. Um, really adopt my own sense of my own sales persona. Each manager was so different. So I would take a little piece of, okay, this manager is really great in front of clients. This manager is really strategic. This manager is really logical. So I would take each little bit of what each individual manager has been really strong at and trying to adopt or emulate or copy what they've done to kind of mold it into my own sales persona. So um, definitely the biggest career opportunity that I've had is to be um, have to have had great managers who help me shape my own sales sales persona. I love that you brought up three really important points. <clears throat> the first one is that mentors need to be invested in you, not just professionally but also personally. And the larger that connection is, the more likely they are to build that relationship with you. And I know I've been in my career very fortunate. I still have mentors and people I've mentored from ten. 15 years ago when I first started in sales. So when you build that connection, it can take you to a lot of places. The second thing I loved is that your mentor was a man because even though we are women trying to uplift women, men need to help us on our journey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Having those male allies, especially in technical sales organizations where a lot of leadership may be men or the more legacy account executives and sales professionals may be men. I'm really glad to hear that a man was able to help you on that journey. So thank you for, to him for being an ally. And then the third thing I love that you said was about the growth, having three completely different managers in the enterprise sales space. And often we want to gravitate towards working for people that are like us because we get along with them better. We understand them more easily. We just sort of connect on a better level, but often the people that are most different from us can teach us the most about a role and teach us to look at it through a different lens. So I love that you had that experience, whether it was strategic, whether it was process driven, whether it was more analytical and you're able to learn from those three different types of leaders and that they all got promoted. So clearly they were very good at their job. And they've been teaching you the best ways to hone your craft. Mm -hmm. So switching gears a lot, um, I want to talk about one of the things that we talk about a lot is sales and is an incredibly challenging career. <laughs> it's not for the faint of heart. Um, you need to be self-motivated. You need to be driven. You need to be resilient and you need to be willing to put in the work. And so every sales career comes with challenges. So I'd like to ask each of you, what has been the biggest challenge in your career so far and how did you overcome it? Anisha, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. So I think um, for me, one of the biggest challenges has been being in an environment and being in a uh, kind of industry that's very male dominated. Um, and so, you know, it is being someone who kind of looks younger and is female, sometimes it's hard to get, be taken seriously. Um, and, you know, I would say that I've 
been pretty lucky in some scenarios where I've gotten really good clients that don't really make me feel like that. But then of course you do have some unfortunate situations. Um, what's really helped through that is the support that I've had internally. Um, so our team and all of our managers, like they do a really good job of making sure that we all feel empowered to be in the room, to be the person in charge in a room, whether it's three clients or 30, um, and we're the ones who know the most. Um, and so that's definitely been a challenge to kind of maneuver, how do I present myself, making sure I'm not adjusting who I am too much, um, but just enough, right, to, to make sure that I'm taken seriously without kind of playing into the stereotypes that end up being thrown around. Um, and, you know, having that support internally where something comes up, I know that all the way up to my global VP, I have someone who's in my corner and is going to back me up. So when there's pushback from clients or when there's, when a situation comes up, I don't feel like I'm on my own to fight it. I have someone who is going to be able to back me up. Um, and, you know, a lot of times those are men, but like you said, it's really important for men to be involved. And I think all the women on my team have always felt that kind of support where they know they're not going into those situations alone. It's really tough. It's sort of a double-edged sword when you're both a female in the role and you're young in the role. Um, because already those two separate things can create a lot of ideas about what you can contribute, but together it's a lot more challenging. And I even found in my own career that after I got to a certain level at Verizon, people just started looking at me differently. Once they thought I was old enough <laughs> to do the job or seasoned enough or more experienced enough. I'd love to hear, do you have a specific example that sticks out to you about a time that people were discounting you and your leadership stepped in or a time that you felt like people weren't really seeing you and how you overcame that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there was, there were, a, you know, I can recall a couple of incidents with clients, um, coming back and not necessarily feeling comfortable with me being the person that was working with them to move the deal forward. Um, and there was definitely some pushback. I, you know, I'm an assertive person. I'm not very shy, so I have no problem pushing back on things, but sometimes, you know, they don't really listen if it's coming from me. Um, and my, my VP did step in and, you know, sort of have the conversation with me in the room, but making sure that he didn't come in to say, this is what we are doing. It was coming in to say, Nisha is the person that is going to be leading this. And, you know, I have faith in her to move this forward. Um, and it was a conversation with an internal group and an external group that, uh, just making sure that he backed me up with me having the authority in that situation is what really helped. I think after that, they, you know, kind of took me more seriously. And I would say that um, as I've got progressed in my career, it's happened a little bit less because I personally have gotten more confident in my ability to do the job. And as people internally and externally see that I'm extremely capable, um, then they start to trust me more and kind of through word of mouth, other people get introduced to me even externally by clients, clients are saying like, hey, it's Nisha, she's great. She knows exactly what she's doing. Like she's going to help you out with your problem. Um, so building that credibility has also really helped. It's really important, especially for leadership to step in, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think when you have a credible leader that steps in and just resets the bench and says, listen, she's phenomenal at her job. You need to treat her as such and respect her. That goes a long way. And I'm glad to hear that that leader did that early for you. And then you've continued on that journey of being able to do it for yourself. So thank you. And then Joanne, what about you, especially going from a BDR role to start and moving into enterprise sales? And I'm not sure if you mentioned this yet, but Joanne manages basically the Fortune 100 at the organization. She works with the highest level of customers that a sales professional can work with at Appian. So what's the challenge that you dealt with and how did you overcome with in terms of, terms of being impacted in your career? Yeah, and very similarly to Nisha, in the beginning, when I first started out in enterprise sales, um, I definitely had the same concerns. And it was more so around um, my own confidence of my own abilities to be able to sell to these Fortune 100 clients. So it's, it's funny because the people who are around you and your managers and your mentors and, and those who have ha put you into this role, they believe in you. But the person you, you should really believe in yourself is yourself to to do these things. So I actually asked that question to my first manager who was um, a lot more similar to, to me. She was a female. She was a lot younger than typical VPs. And I asked her, did you ever feel like when you were in sales that you felt um, too young, 
or ever had any kind of discrimination because you're a woman selling to primarily larger, or the large group of the people we sell to are primarily senior male executives. And she said she never had that thought. And I was actually shocked. And that really stood with me because she said she never had that thought. And maybe it was more so because she felt confident in herself. And so I really took that as to, I need to be confident in myself because she believes in me. So I need to believe in myself. So ever since um, that notion of being too young or being a woman in sales, like I, I immediately early on was like, I can't think about that. I can, I'm fully capable of doing all the same type of work, selling to all the same type of clients, maybe even better than some of my peers. So with that mindset, that's how I approached every single opportunity, whether it's like a Fortune 100 client or maybe a little bit smaller, each opportunity, whether you're talking to a VP or a CEO of a Fortune 100 client, you're in that position for a reason. And you need to take that confidence and you need to take your abilities and believe in yourself that, hey, I'm I'm doing the enterprise sales because I'm put in this position. I have the capabilities. Really, you're just speaking to people who are just people. It's not like, you know, the way that I approach the CEOs, obviously you have to have some type of professionalism when you approach a a C-level meeting. But at the end of the day, they're just people too. So the more and the more you can be your true authentic self instead of trying to be someone that you're not, that's what I felt has been really um, beneficial because if I, try, if I try to be, you know, an older, um, older man trying to sell sales, like that just won't work for me because that's not yeah. how they see me. So being really true and authentic to yourself is probably the best advice that I was given really early on in my career and not being scared to show that. It's really important because I think, especially in environments where you're dealing with senior male leadership as your customer or your prospect, you feel like you have to present a certain way, but the most successful salespeople are able to bring their authentic self to the sales process. And people, like you said, they buy from people and they trust you and they engage with you and they like you and they want to learn from you. And then eventually they want to partner with you if you're able to bring that authentic self. And if you're not bringing that authentic self, they can also sense that. Um, If you don't feel comfortable in your own shoes, they're not going to think that you feel comfortable in selling the product. So it's a really important piece of the puzzle. And then the other thing I love that you said was that your VP (laughs) at one point who was a woman was just like, I never felt like that. That wasn't an issue for me. And it's amazing because the, the concept of imposter syndrome resonates with so many women and it doesn't with men, even in just the application process. Women only apply to a job if they have 95% or more of the qualities on the job description because they have to feel like they're fully prepared. And men apply somewhere between 40 and 60%. And they're like, meh, I have half of it. I can learn the rest. And so it's, I think you bring up a really good point is when we feel like we have imposter syndrome in our roles, whether we're new, whether we're young in our career, whether we're a female, whether we just think the role is bigger than us. Your leadership put you there for a reason. You went through an interview process and you beat out the rest of the candidates. You were the best choice. And so just remembering that every single day that no one gives you a job in corporate America if you can't do it. (laughs) So that's a really good point. And I love that. I want to switch gears for a second because I know that one of the biggest things we've been seeing in our Fair God Boss community is with the havoc of COVID and shelter in place and working remotely, Women already struggled with work-life balance before this moment in time. And it's become something that has been really, really difficult to manage over the last year and a half. And so I would love to ask you a little bit about work-life balance, like what it means to you and how you're able to achieve that working at Appian. Because I think one of the biggest issues in sales also is sales is not necessarily an eight to five job. It is a job that requires you to answer emails and take customer calls before and after hours, depending on your clients. You have constant work to do. And the more work you put in, the more commission you're going to make or the more results you're going to see. So it's a difficult thing to walk away from. (laughs) Whereas other jobs, if you know you have a parameter and you just have to do that work, but you can always be doing more. You can always be selling more. You can always be more successful. So Jessica, could you start with a little bit about what work-life balance has meant to you um, and how you're able to make this work for you in a role that is demanding and during a time that has been really challenging? Sure, absolutely. So I've been fortunate enough to, and I don't know if I mentioned this at the top of the call, but I actually work remotely and I have since since I joined Appian in 2018. Um, So 
while I've had the pleasure of working remotely and kind of having to figure out like what work-life balance means working from a home office, I've definitely seen a shift and a difference over the past, I probably since COVID started, um, since everybody's kind of shifted to that and has been forced to shift to that, it's been a lot more, um, it seems very intense. Like the meetings just kind of start to become back to back. Um, and so what I've done is really be very deliberate about my time and managing my schedule. And I'll set work blocks to follow up on emails, to craft emails. I am, um, you know, when I'm scheduling meetings with people, I'll actually do like a 50 minute meeting or a 45 minute meeting to give myself a five or a 10 minute um, virtual travel break or bathroom break or whatever yeah. you want to call that, because you, you really have to, um, especially just to be able to step away from your computer for a minute to, to energize and recharge. Um, what has really helped me, I would say through COVID is I've gotten a lot stronger and a lot better practicing things like mindfulness. And, um, I actually go to acupuncture once a week to help kind of reset myself. Um, I have the call map on my phone that you can do like a 10 minute meditation. And just to take that 10, 15 minutes to step away from your computer and kind of re-energize and recenter yourself and then kind of come back with a fresh perspective has been hugely helpful for me and helping me stay grounded. I would say another big thing uh, that I've really implemented for myself is outside of my working hours, I, I, I basically turn my chat and my email off. So I try as best as I can to not respond to those things because I do want to make sure that I'm giving, I have a two-year-old daughter and, and a husband. So I want to make sure that I'm also sharing myself with them as well as, you know, being the best that I can be for work. But that's really helped me stay as grounded as I can. It's helped me kind of overcome that burnout. So I know everybody's kind of getting there because, you know, your home is your computer, your computer, your work is in your house, right? Or, or somewhere around you. So being able to be very deliberate about the time that you're spending at work and the time that you're spending away from home. I, I something as simple as I close my office door when I'm done for the day and I, I, I don't come back to my computer until 8 a.m. the next morning. That's been really critical for me and it's really helped me throughout all of this. I think that's really important. My partner started taking my computer away on the weekends, just putting it in a room and not telling me because then I can't find it. Yeah. But just a quick follow-up question. So I've actually also been remote for the last three and a half years. So it was really interesting when everyone went remote and everyone was like, oh my gosh, how did you do this for three and a half years? Mm -hmm. But did you feel like your habits changed when shelter in place started? Or were you doing all of those things beforehand in terms of blocking time on your calendar? you know, shutting things down, like email and messaging using your mindfulness tools. Was that before or after COVID started? Um, that was definitely after COVID started. So again, I, I mentioned I have a two-year-old daughter. So when shelter in place went into effect, she was now here as well. So having to split time watching and caring for her between my husband and I, and I'm anybody that has kids, especially like very young kids, you know, that you can't just set them in front of a TV or a computer and let them do something. They're very hands-on. So I had to be really critical about here's our schedule. So I would, you know, I would do half of the morning or up until about noon. And then my husband and I would switch out. So because my work day, especially when shelter in place went into effect, got shortened so much, I had to be very, very deliberate on this is the time that I'm doing this. And this is the time that I'm doing this. Um, and because that be, having to manage a schedule like that became so, you know, it, it I don't want to say burdensome, but it was just very heavy that kind of forced me to have to find avenues and ways to be able to ground myself and to, you know, take a step back, take a deep breath and just, you know, it's, it's life. And this is a Valley and we're going to get through this. Um, so I, I didn't do it as I wish I would have found it sooner. Um, if that's a, if that's a, no, no. <laughs> that was one of the first things I said is we were probably six months into shelter in place is I was like, why didn't I know any of this before? And it was because when previously when people were remote working, there weren't a lot of people that were remote working. Companies didn't really focus on supporting their remote workers. We were just sort of on our islands to figure it out. And then as soon as shelter in place happened, all these resources came out and there were webinars about it and podcasts and 
articles and people were talking about it in communities and all of a sudden this thing that some of us had been dealing with for years sort of on our own <laughs> became this this public issue yeah. and so I actually also feel like I've gotten better during remote work so I'm glad to hear that you found that balance and with a two-year-old and a dog and a partner and all of those things and you're you're thriving and finding out the best way to manage your time and your energy I also want to ask Nisha about this um, because I'd love to hear about how you set balance and how you have that flexibility too. Yeah, so I mean, I was also remote only for about six months or so um, before COVID hit. So I started to get into some some routine with being remote, but I also still traveled a lot. So it was still a big difference between you know pre COVID and during. Um, I think for me, it was a lot of stuff similar to what Jessica was talking about is setting boundaries. Um, it was very difficult in the beginning. And I also am uh, doing my MBA part time on evenings and weekends. So my I, I can't close my office door because I also have to sit here for class three hours after the workday is over. Um, and so being in that one spot all the time for everything, it was it was definitely a lot. Uh, I did a lot of the same things um, got into mindfulness, got into meditation. I tried to do it before, but definitely got more into it um, during COVID, um, especially five or six months into COVID when I really started to feel burnout. Uh, I also listened to this audiobook called Burnout. Um, it's by these two sisters. Highly recommend everybody listen to it, especially women, but everybody. Um, that really helped me understand how I was holding stress in my body and how I wasn't really completing the stress cycle. And I, you know, I had kind of given up on exercise and stuff and realized that was a terrible thing for me to do. Um, so it was really about making blocks in my calendar, trying to be mindful of my own calendar and also other people. When I saw like back-to-back -back meetings, but not scheduling something right after, but giving breaks. Um, and also making sure that my work day, when I had class, my work day would end around five. So I could get an hour before class started to just walk around or just go sit on the sofa, whatever I needed to do to kind of take myself out of the mindset of work and get into the class mindset. So it was, it was a challenge, but you know, again, I'd say that my, my manager, he did a pretty good job of what, you know, he'd tell us sometimes, like, if you have some downtime, just go take a nap or something, you know, you know, he'd tell us to sort of take that time off to just reset yourself and catch up on work or catch up on things that you haven't been able to do so far, but don't feel the need to always be on for everything. Um, so that was really helpful too. It's interesting how burnout can create empathy for other people and their situations. Whereas previously people just scheduled back to back to back meetings. Now you're like, I would never schedule someone with a back to back meeting because I don't want to be in a back to back meeting. <laughs> and so I'm going to give it a 15 minute or hour break. I also think, you know, one of the things that we did forget about for a while is when, if you were working, whether we were working remotely before or in an office, it's just getting up to walk around, like just the health benefit of taking your eyes off of a screen, getting up, moving your blood, doing, getting some fresh air, whatever, to make sure that you're not just stuck in this constant overflow of energy, because then you become less productive. And so I'm glad to hear that you found some ways to make it work while also doing your MBA. So <laughs> no easy task, <laughs> but glad to hear that you're finding that balance. So one of the things we talk about at Fairy God Boss a lot is culture, and that's really what we're based on. We're a site that reveals the culture of companies to the female workforce, and it's actually the number one thing that women consider when they're looking at a job is what of the culture of the company? Will I fit in? Will I like it there? Can I be successful? So I would love to hear about, in your words, what's Appian's culture, and also ERGs are a huge part of that, employee resource groups. And so what does your involvement look like there? So why don't we start with Joanne? Yeah, I would say culture is like, that's such a key word for Appian. Um, I think if you look at any other reviews online, or if you hear our CEO speak, culture, the word culture will come up so many times. Um, it's something that Appian prides ourselves on, um, is that the culture is the primary reason why you would choose to work for Appian. I remember speaking with a lot of, um, before COVID, when we were in HQ, um, there were, every summer we have like two new groups of interns who come in and um, they would have very competitive offers from like Amazon, Google, Facebook, et cetera. And they would say, you know, the reason why I chose Appian was because of the people and the culture. So it's something that is very apparent really early on. And I think it really starts with 
first of all, our recruiters are amazing um, and they really embody the Appian culture of um, being kind, being authentic, being, you know, real people at real, doing real jobs, doing real work. I think um, that in itself really embodies Appian culture. Um, I've been at companies before where prior, just the question we're talking about where you would be worked to death and you would have, you know, eight hour meetings back to back. And like, when do you even go to the bathroom? So just even like little things like that, where you just have, okay, this is, we're working, we're all humans here. Like we just need a five, 10 minute break. Um, just even little things like that, I think help contribute to the Appian culture of just really truly understanding and getting to know, getting to know people on a deeper personal level. Um, in terms of ERG, so ever since I joined Appian, I've been involved with Appian Women, which is one of our affinity groups. Uh, we have a handful of other affinity groups as well, Appian Women. Um, I started out six years ago at Appian Women when we were you know, a lot smaller. Um, and so it's just been really great to see the progression of how we've grown as an affinity group. So this year, I am the VP of Appian Women, and really our mission statement is to help and foster a community of women at Appian to not only connect and inspire and grow just the women in technology at Appian, but also to help um, the community around us. So we're headquartered out of Washington, DC, and we have a couple of initiatives this year where we're really trying to give back to the community of women around us, help mentor younger females who might not have the same opportunities um, that they would traditionally have and help them get, you know, careers in technology and open their eyes to um, a whole different field of things that they typically wouldn't see um, had they not, you know, been engaged with a mentor who's already in sales. So um, with Appian Women, it's just been really um, a great journey to see how much we've come so far in terms of from six years ago, where we're doing a lot more like internal meetings, career development, leadership skills, to now we're trying to reach outside and give back to the community. I love that, that your ERG is not just focused on internal, that you're actually giving back to the community and providing resources for women. And that's sort of the next level of ERGs, which tells me that Appian's advanced in their journey of inclusion, belonging, diversity, and also how they're going to magnify that out into the world. So, and again, another busy woman on this call, you're the head of the women's ERG, your VP, and you're also in a full-time sales role. So I love it. Jessica, what about you? Yeah, so I'm actually uh, part of two different of our ERG groups. So I'm on the board of our Appian Veterans Group, which is actually a newly formed group, something I'm very passionate about. While I'm not a veteran myself, uh, I have come from a long lineage. So definitely love that. Um, it, it, it's not just veterans globally, but it's also frontline responders and, and healthcare workers and, and things like that. So the scope of that group, even though it's newly formed, doing some really great and exciting things, both internally and externally. And then I also, we, I believe it was, it's been, a, it's, we're about a year old and both Joanne and Nisha are on uh, the board as well, but I'm the VP of our women in sales group. So we're just a small group uh, that kind of focuses on some of the things like um, advocacy, career growth and development, uh, just what can we do to help better empower the female um, population of sales at Appian. So some really great things that we have with that. And one thing I will say too, as far as just really speaking to, you know, what does it mean to be involved? One of the things that I, I did with my team um, moving into our sales kickoff event this year is we created some think tanks because what I wanted to do was make sure that we heard the voice of our sales organization, our go-to-market team to figure out what is it that they want and what is it that they need to feel set up for success and how can our team provide that to them? So we were able to do some small focus groups to, uh, take that and then we actually created an entire professional development track for our go-to-market team during our sales kickoff event this year so that was really to me um i was i got really excited about that to be able to you know number one hear what the field was hungry for and then be able to provide them with that so i think that just really speaks to the kind of culture that we have and you know we always kind of want to know what do people want and what do people need to feel empowered and feel successful and i really think that that appian does that that's so key because we know from the research that the number one thing that all employees care about when they're in their organization is they want to feel heard, they want to be recognized, and they want to feel valued. 
Mm-hmm. So the fact that you are already doing that, it's also phenomenal, not just from an employee experience, but for retention, engagement, and for really having people bring their authentic selves to work and produce and be successful at their top potential because they are heard. So I love that you're doing that. I feel like a lot of sales organizations, the messaging rolls downhill. Here's your quotas. Here's your objectives. Go out there and charge and get it done. So it's amazing to hear that that sort of environment exists at Appian and that women are part of the conversation and you're taking that feedback and it's an ongoing conversation for people to be successful. I love that. Nisha, what about you? Yeah, I mean, so overall culture for me, the reason I joined was, you know, similar to Joanne, just like it's a really great culture and you can really see that during the recruiting process and every, with everyone you interview with. Um, and then about probably six or seven months after I joined, um, we actually created a group called Appian Heritage. So that's our diversity, equity, inclusion group. And our mission is really to create a supportive um, environment for people of all races and all backgrounds, all cultures at Appian. Um, we've definitely come a long way in three years. It's been really great to see how that group has grown from probably a you know, group of four or five people to a board of uh, 10 to 15 now and over like two or 300 members or so. Um, so it's really been amazing. And, and you know, similar to Appian Women, we have an internal focus and an external focus. So internally, we, get, we do a lot of work around um, allyship education and just general education around the experiences of people of color at the workplace and in general, um, as well as leadership and professional development, trying to make sure that people of color feel supported and feel like they have a career at Appian, as well as helping managers who support people of color understand how they can be better managers. Um, And then externally, we've done a lot of work around recruiting um, and trying to participate in events, expand uh, recruiting to, you know, to HBCUs and other universities that we haven't traditionally recruited at in the past. Uh, I think, you know, overall as a company, we're doing a lot of work there in general, which has been really great to see. And it's been uh, very rewarding as part of Appian Heritage, uh, as the president of Appian Heritage, to be able to lead those efforts and help us uh, support our recruiting team in doing those things and creating that community and network outside as well as internally. So uh, it's been very rewarding work overall. And, you know, I can just see some of the changes of people feel like there's a safe space for them to speak up um, and really feel like they're supported and heard. And you can see people doing posts about different holidays and congratulating each other and celebrating each other. So it's really been a great community to be a part of. It's really impressive to hear how much work that Appian is doing internally, how it's reflected in the culture, and even the fact that the three of you who are very busy professionals between your professional life and your personal lives are all in leadership in ERGs. I think it really speaks volumes to the amount of commitment Appian has, but also how your employees feel about being a part of it and that they are a part of it. So Mm -hmm. thank you for the work that you're doing there. I kind of want to close on the idea of advice because part of the reason that Fairy God Boss exists is it started as a platform for women to share their experience and uplift other women and the place that women could get advice. So I would love to know from each of you starting, what's the best piece of career related advice that someone's ever given you? It doesn't have to be an Appian leader or an Appian colleague, um, but what's the best piece of advice? And Jessica, I'd like to start with you. Sure. So the best piece of advice that I've ever gotten, and it's definitely been a journey to really take that um, and and move forward with it. But the best piece of advice that I've ever ever received is that failure is always going to be part of the process. So um, you can't be afraid to take a risk just because you're afraid to fail. Um, Without failure and, and being able to make mistakes along that journey, just for me personally, like I would not be the person that I am today. I wouldn't have grown. I I don't think that you can grow if you're not making mistakes and you're not having hiccups uh, that you're having in challenges that you're having to overcome across, you know, across your journey. So I think that, you know, if you're not constantly growing, if you're not learning, then, then you're not able to become the best version of yourself. And I think that for me personally, like that's my goal. And I seem to, that it seems to be kind of a resonating theme at Appy and that it's like, we're all kind of on this journey to become the best per- versions of ourselves. So I think that if you're passionate about something, you know, whether it's work related or um, personally, then, you know, you kind of have to go all in. So put the, put those fears aside and just kind of jump in head first. And I think that you'll be amazed 
by what you can produce and what it teaches you and how much stronger that you actually can become once you're on the other side of it. I agree. It's in the uncomfortable that growth happens. Mm -hmm. And we as women and as just as an American society, we have been socialized to think that failure is a bad thing instead of a learning opportunity. And everyone fails all of the time. The difference is how people deal with it. Do they get upset and pretend it didn't happen? Do they try to cover it up or do they just embrace it and own it and say, this is an opportunity to learn and I'm gonna become a better individual for it. Do you have a specific failure that happened at work um, that really was a huge learning opportunity for you or personally, that's also fine too. <laughs> yeah, I would say just, you know, in, in the job that I do, I, you know, responsible for, for uh, creating and implementing and delivering training, you know, not every training session or not every program is going to be a knock out of the park, right? You're not going to knock it out of the park every time, especially with, you know, in a really fast paced environment where there's always something new and you're always needing to, to learn something. So I would say, you know, through all of the trainings that we've had and things like that, some of them have been great and some of them are not so great. So kind of taking a look back and, and basically doing a little bit of analysis, like what worked or what didn't work or that training session was terrible. So what do we do? Like, how do we change that? Or what do we need to do before that to get them ready to take on that? So I just think, um, you know, as, as me and, in what I'm, you know, doing on a, you know, a pretty regular basis with like just the training piece and like, having reps participate in some of the activities, um, just talking with them, working with them, understanding what their needs were, like doing a little bit of analysis at the end. Did this help? Are you, do you feel more confident after this? Are you more competent after this? Right. And if you can't answer those, you know, with a positive or a yes, then, you know, we need to take a step back and figure out what do we need to do to kind of readjust and rescope to, to, to get there. So again, to your point, I feel like sometimes it's just, well, that's checking a box it's done. It's over with like, let's move on. But you know, the best way to be like the best versions of yourself and the best version of your company is to actually go back and audit, make sure that everybody's needs are being met and that the goal is, is we're, we're getting closer to the goal. I love that. And I think some of the best innovation comes out from people saying like, why didn't this work? Or tell me why this isn't going to work mm -hmm. and challenging that. And that's where the most interesting conversations happen. And those conversations can happen at any level in the organization. It doesn't have to be an executive or a leader that comes up with the idea. Sometimes the people that are on the front line have the best insight into what's happening and how you can change. And the other thing I think is really interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, is that one of the great things about being in sales, although there's a lot of them that prepare you for your real life as well, is that failure is part of your daily routine. If you're on client calls every day that you don't sell something or you don't get that next meeting or book the first meeting or convince a customer that this is the right solution, I mean, essentially you're kind of failing. So it gives you this resilience about how you approach life. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that you've taken that and really understood that that's where the growth begins and use that to your advantage because a lot of people in other industries and other roles don't fail as part of their daily routine. And so they handle it very differently. Um, so that's, I think, one of the biggest gifts of sales is that we're made to be resilient. And we're also made to realize that failure is temporary and just part of the journey. And we'll win again tomorrow, <laughs> the day after. <laughs> I'd also love to hear from Joanne on this in terms of what's you know a great piece of advice or the best piece of advice that someone's given you and why. Yeah, so I actually, um, to put words to the best piece of advice, the words came through a realization pretty recently. So during um, Women's History Month earlier this year in March, we did highlights on um, a couple key women at Appian. And so one of our VPs of marketing, her, we asked her what's her best piece of advice she could give to women. And her advice was bring someone along for the ride. And that really resonated with me because I realized that I've been doing that all along, but I never put words to it. So I would say bring someone along for the ride. And when I look at that VP of Mar our VP of marketing, when I look at her team, her team primarily is all women, but each one of those women have been promoted or they've been given awards like every quarter at Appian. And so she's really doing a great job herself of getting promoted herself, but then also getting her whole team promoted. So I, that really struck with me because she has brought her whole team along for the ride with her. So. I realized that in my career at Appian, all of my managers that I've mentioned before, they brought me along for the ride, whether it's helping me getting promoted, helping me get raises, helping me get new opportunities. And so for that, 
I should practice what what I, I what I preach, and I should also practice what I've been fortunate enough to receive. Um, and so, this year specifically, uh, I made more of a conscientious effort to identify a few key folks who are a little bit newer in their in their sales career, whether they're newer to Appian or they're newer in terms of um, new roles, like right out of college who are associate solutions consultants or new business development representatives and really helping them kind of navigate their career path like the other managers have done for me. Um, so, you know, there's, there's space for everyone. <laughs> Nobody really has to step on each other's toes. And I think one thing that women are known for historically in the past is that, you know, we're all like kind of, all the women kind of like bicker or like they like step on each other's toes and they're really competitive with one another. And I, I really don't see any need for that. I really hate that. And I think seeing just that one VP's team of bringing everyone along for the ride really shows a huge testament of, you know, if I'm successful, the people around me are going to be successful. And that's ultimately what matters. So um, I would say definitely bring someone along the ride with you. It's not fun to be at the top by yourself. You want to enjoy it with people who, who work with you. Absolutely. And I love that you probably didn't even realize you were doing it for a while, but it started with one of your managers and mentors bringing you along for the ride. And then you feel that desire to give back. And I agree with you. There's not a limited amount of space for women at the top in any organization, in any department. We create that in our own minds. We need to let that go and start bringing more women along for the ride. One of the podcasts I listened to recently, um, the, the speaker on it, she said she's, her focus for 2021 is to be intentional and help out a woman once a week. And just think about being intentional about it and making sure that you're bringing along other people for the ride. So I have one last question to ask for each of you. And then um, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. We'll start with Jessica. But what is one piece of advice you would give to your younger self, whether in your career or in a sales professional? Um, you got this. So I think just like every other female, like the self-confidence thing is real and um, if I had the level of confidence, you know, three, four or five years ago that I've had now, I can only imagine where I would be. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of things, you know, in my professional journey and personal journey that my confidence has kind of put me in a place where I, I, I could have done better and I could have been better. So, you know, I, I would say like, just take the risk. You got it. And just don't worry about it and go all in. So I think that would be my, my best, my, my best piece of advice to my younger self. Love it. I want to give that piece of advice to every woman who's <laughs> earlier in her career journey. Nisha, what about you? Yeah, I think pretty similar to that. Um, mine would be you're more capable, you're more capable of more than you think you are. Um, so I think I had the same struggles and same issues when I was transitioning from a software developer into sales. I had such like so much imposter syndrome doing that, thinking I had no business going into the skill I've never been experienced in. Um, and now looking back, it, I understand that I had the skill set that I needed. I had the talent that I needed to be here. Um, so I would say, just, yeah, to my younger self and to other people starting out, it's you're definitely capable of a lot more than you think you are. So give yourself credit <laughs> and like believe in yourself and do the things that you want to do. <laughs> The other thing that really struck me about your journey is you said that you relocated to Chicago for your MBA. Mm -hmm. um, and so I love the idea too of, you know, telling your younger self, choose a company that's going to allow flexibility. Your life is going to change. You may not always be in the same place. Your goals might not be the same. Your family situation will change. So choose a company that can support you on that. So yeah. I love that. Yep. <laughs> Joanne, what would your piece of advice to your younger self be? Yeah, it would be, you know, along the lines of what I said before, is just be your true authentic self and bring your personality to your the workplace because that's essentially what's going to, your personality and who you are as a person is going to be what's, what gets you promoted. It's going to be who you surround yourself with. It's going to be who gravitates towards you. It's going to be who, how you, how your personality is, what takes you to those new places and to meet those new people and those new opportunities. So if I had been, more of my true authentic self earlier on, um, those conversations I think would have happened even faster for me. Um, so just don't be scared to be yourself. You know, don't be scared to show your personality. Um, just you know, be true to yourself because if you're not, then that will show a lot more than not showing your true authentic self. I love it. 
I'm going to add one too. So my piece of advice for my younger self would be don't give up and find your people. I applied for my first management job in my mid twenties. It took me seven different interview processes to finally get the job. And I think a lot of people would have given up probably after round two or round three, even my colleagues were like, what are you doing? <laughs> You're never going to get this job. And I was like, I believe I can do this job. I just need to find someone else who believes it too. And eventually after all those people that told me that I would never be a good manager, that I would never be a manager at the company, I got the job and I went on to become one of the top performing managers in the country. And so don't give up. The right opportunity is out there and find your people. Now we have some questions from the audience. The first one is we have um, Soma that said she'd love to hear more about the hybrid tech and sales roles. She's attracted the opportunity for the exposure to a variety of industries that's unique to sales, although she has a technical background and she wants a career that she can engage in those skills. So how do you find yourself using and growing your full skill, skill set, particularly on the technical sides? This one's for you, Nisha. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I would say like I've definitely uh, obviously developed a lot of sk sales skills that I didn't have before, um, but I have also developed my technical skills a lot too. Uh, part of my job is to know anything and everything about our platform. Um, it's a very technical and complex platform, very powerful. And so my job is to know how it works, how to build on it, what's like, what goes on inside of it, how it's created by our engineers, um, and really be able to answer any questions that are that our uh, clients or prospects have from a technical perspective. So, you know, depending on the day, sometimes I'm just in front of clients and I'm doing meetings and I'm learning about the industry, I'm learning about the business. And sometimes I'm heads down building a demo, building something out, or just learning more about our new features or our new tech. So I would say it's been very interesting. And I've really loved that I've been able to stay in touch with my technical background and also gain a whole new set of skills around business and client relationships. Are there any resources or any activities you do outside of your role to keep your technical skills sharp? Um, I think, you know, I mean, I, I listen to, well, I guess more in the business, I listen to podcasts and stuff. On the technical side, I think it's just uh, keeping up with what are the new trends, what are the new things that are coming out. I think a lot of our, um, our engineering team does a really good job of keeping our platform really up to date. So when I'm seeing new things coming out or we're putting in like a new, some kind of new piece of tech within the platform in the back end, uh, you know, I'll Google that maybe and just kind of learn more about it. Sometimes I, we also have a really, um, really good technical team that I can always reach out to. So sometimes it's just about keeping up with conversations that they're having around these new features or asking them questions. So I really, it's just about educating myself whenever I come across something that I'm not familiar with. Excellent. Now from um, Nadine, we have, what is something that impacted a change in your perspective? Joanne, do you wanna start? Yeah, I would say um, probably something that impacted me prior to even joining Appian was um, for uh, my previous role, I was actually let go because of a reduction in the workforce and so at that time, I was really looking at like a career change, like, do I want to stay in sales or do I want to do like more marketing, social media, et cetera. And so that really changed my perspective. Um, it wasn't until I had the interviews at Appian as a business development representative that it kind of brought me back to, okay, I can still do be in sales, but really like Appian was the right fit for me to do sales in. So that really changed my perspective because prior to, um, Prior to getting a new job, the only types of jobs I was looking for was actually like purely marketing. So I really wanted to do a career shift. Um, but I think once you find that company or or once you find that role where you're like, okay, this is like it feels right, and it, you just have like that gut feeling of this is what this is what really makes sense for me. Um, that really changed my perspective to kind of go back into sales, and I don't regret it. I feel like I would have regretted it had I not gone towards the sales position. Absolutely. That actually brings up another question in the chat about people that are in transitions. Um, so people that are either in customer success, account management, or something sort of adjacent, they want to go into new business sales. What would you say, each of you, just one necessary skill that you'd have to have to make that transition? Jessica, start us off. <laughs> I would say, um, you know, a lot of the things like 
from an Appian cells perspective, you know, you kind of think of our, you know, like relationship building, which it seems like a customer success account management role would also would already have that. But I think in our line of business specifically, um, one of the things that we really try to, to get our reps to strive for to, is, is being a trusted advisor for their customer. So having those relationship skills, being able to Joanne's point that she's you know talked about a couple different times, being your authentic self and, and, and being able to create that type of a relationship in that consultative selling environment is, is definitely critical, um, a, a skill, if you will, for, for an Appian account executive. Nisha, what about you? Yeah, I would say empathy is a big one. I think very, very like similar to what Jess Jessica was saying about relationship building is having empathy. So being able to understand what your peers are going through, being able to understand what your clients and prospects are going through, um, not coming in with any kind of judgment or predisposition around what they should or shouldn't be doing, but really coming in with, I'm here to just understand what problems you're facing and how I can help you with them. So I think having empathy and I guess a bit of humility as well to be in that situation, just be willing to, to listen um, and understand and process that I think is really important. Fantastic. And Joanne? And I would say um, specifically for the account executive role, you really have to have like that go-getter mentality. Um, I've seen people who are hired with, you know, they don't have tech, like sales, software as a sales background, but they have that mentality of, I can get this done. And that really comes across as their true authentic self. Uh, and I've seen people get hired who um, have that mentality and have become really successful at Appian. So as long as you have that drive and that comes across really strongly, I think um, you'll do really well within Appian sales. Fantastic. Well, we are just at time. I want to thank the three of you, Jessica, Nisha, and Joanne. This has been a fabulous conversation. I've learned a lot about Appian and the sales culture. Mm -hmm. And my biggest takeaways were you have a culture of engagement and valuing your employees and their feedback, a culture of support and mentorship, a culture of giving back and not just within Appian, but to the larger community and preparing other women for opportunities in their career and bringing people along for the ride. So I hope everyone today feels inspired to engage with Appian and learn more about a career in sales, and to also think about how you can bring along other women for the ride at your organizations. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.